you for being here tonight. This is, um, I think, the third or fourth online program that we have have done, and um, we're getting better at it. It's it's a lot of fun for us, and you know, I know we're getting people that are joining us from really all over all over the all over the country and all over the world, which is is very exciting. Um, I want to just get started here. So my role in this is really to just do a quick welcome and uh, get us oriented a little bit to this program. And then I want to turn it over to Lisa and Janet. Uh, they really have wonderful content that, that, that I want them to have some time to share with you. Um, as I said, we plan to do this program in April, which is when the Maker and Muse exhibition was or still is, but would have been open to the public and sparkling in our galleries. And at the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater, um, Diamonds, one of George Balanchine's Jules Ballets, would have been sparkling on stage. So that was the genesis for this program and, and what we wanted to um, bring to you and, and, and sort of delve a little bit into that content. Um, I also want to thank Cato Ambrose, who is the Frick's Manager of Partnerships and Performances. Partnerships like this with other organizations are wonderful for us. It lets us really explore different content, and so I, I thank the ballet for partnering with the Frick, and, and we've done other things in the past, and I hope we have a lot more to come. So on the screen, you're seeing the um, entrance to the Maker and Muse exhibition at the Frick. Uh, I miss these spaces so much. None of us have been at work for a long time, and if you're from Pittsburgh or you've been to the Frick, I hope you miss them also. Um, if you haven't visited us before, at some point when we are open again, you'll have to come in and explore us and see what we have to offer. But this is the beginning of the Maker and Muse exhibition, and I just want to take us there briefly for a minute or two to get us in the mood to explore some jewels. Um, I should have said at the beginning, um, we're going to answer questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have something you want to ask us, we'll be kind of filtering those out through the chat function. You can tap that in there for us and we will um, make sure to ask and answer those at the end. So the Maker and Muse exhibition, the official title is Maker and Muse, Early Women and Early 20th Century Art Jewelry. This was organized by the Richard Driehaus Museum in Chicago and it was toured, it's a traveling exhibition coming to us from international arts and artists out of Washington, DC. Um, this exhibition was made possible by the Richard C. Von Hess Foundation and had additional support uh, from Henny Jewelers. So we're grateful to have been able to bring it to Pittsburgh. Um, it was only open in our galleries for a little while before we had to close. While I can't say how, how long will the Frick will be closed, um, we're hoping that this show will still be there for us to, to take a look at when we're able to, to reopen. So this exhibition, uh, here you're seeing one of our, our galleries and some of the cases. It examines art jewelry over about a 50-year period from 1880 until 1930 um, over five distinct international regions. The arts and crafts movement in England, the Art Nouveau movement in France, uh, New York and the gorgeous work of Louis Comfort Tiffany, um, Chicago which was a hotbed for American arts and crafts jewelry, and then Aust Austria and Germany with their, um, their variant on Art Nouveau. So what is art jewelry? Um, here's some, well, let me go back for just a second. So art jewelry is um, handcrafted, typically made of semi-precious materials. So the value in all of the pieces in the exhibition really lies in the originality, in the handiwork, um, in the craftsmanship, rather than in the um, stones and, and metals themselves. They tend to be less precious, but the value is in the work and the creation. The appeal, this is really the appeal of these pieces. Each of them is original and authentic, uh, much like the costumes I think that Janet's going to talk about in a little while. Um, these are true works of art that are meant to be individual and personal and very, very special. Art jewelry styles were also connected to trends in fashion and design. And what's interesting about this exhibition, and in the title we call it out, um, jewelry is one of the areas where women were able to kind of gain a foothold and, and start um, taking up some of that craft in some of these different movements. There are some additional things in the exhibition, and I put this in because I love both of these images. Um, on the left, you are seeing um, the uh, gorgeous lamp by French designer Francois Raoul Larcher. It's called the Loewy Fuller lamp. Um, Loewy Fuller was a dancer who created this wonderful chore choreography with um, fabric where she would spin and twist and turn. Um, and it was um, 
something that there's no video, I don't believe, that is capturing Loewe doing the actual dances, but um, there are images of other women sort of recreating the same dance. So we did have some dance in the galleries as well. Um, the lamp on the right is from Tiffany Studios, and if you can look closely at the lines in the shade, you'll see there's incredible kind of filigree work made with twisted gold that mimics some of the work in the jewelry in the exhibition. Here's an image of um, the first gallery in the show, and there's a, we have several videos that we're playing um, showing women kind of dancing in that Louis Fuller technique on the wall, and there's the lamp below that you can see. So just imagine that you're in our space and you're watching this woman swirl and dance. Just some close-ups of the, some of the jewelry in the exhibition. Again, really unique um, individual pieces that were um, handcrafted in all of these different regions and just, you know, show the spectacular range of craftsmanship and design and style. Um, jewels are something that is universally appealing, whether they're valuable in their material or, or whether it's, it's about the style and, and the, um, the craftsmanship behind them. And we just really love the idea of linking up this idea of jewels and jewelry in their literal sense with jewels and jewelry in the sense of the um, wonderful ballets that were created by George Balanchine. So I want to turn it over now to Lisa All, Manager of Audience Programs and Archives from the Ballet, who's going to introduce us to Balanchine and his work, um, and then turn it over after that to Janet to talk about the costumes for the ballets, which you will be um, stunned by, I am sure. So Lisa, thank you so much. Okay, sure, great, thank you. Just get my screen on here, just a second. Oops. Sorry about that, just <laughs> a little bit of toggling. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you so much, Amanda, um, and thanks to Cato and Lizzie, everybody at the Frick for um, getting this together tonight and for kind of revamping what our program was going to be in April. We love this connection too. And we love it because ballet is an art form that really truly is full of makers, dance makers, choreographers, costume makers and designers, uh, set designers, set builders, lighting designers, um, and dancers, of course, who, um, make this art come to life, who take all of this artistry and all those individual crafts and make it come to life through their bodies. Um, and ballet is also often about muses as well. Um, certainly in the Romantic era, ballets um, were inspired by individual um, choreographers, muses, and up through Balanchine and into today even as well. So I'm going to talk briefly about Jules and two of its creators, choreographer George Balanchine and then um, costume designer Barbara Karinska, and then Janet um, Campbell will take over and talk about making costumes for Jules. So Jules is a ballet that was created in 1967 by George Balanchine. It's an abstract ballet, so it has no storyline. It's about pure dancing. It's all about the dance. It's broken down into three acts, emeralds, rubies, and diamonds. And was created, as we said, by George Balanchine. And Balanchine is one of the, if, if not the most important choreographer of the 20th century. He's known as the father of American ballet, born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1904 and trained at the Imperial School of Ballet, the great Russian classical ballet school and in that Russian tradition. And as a young man, he spent some time in France where he worked with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. This was a very uh, famous, influential, innovative ballet company and he really got some of his grounding and choreography there. Um, and then came to America in the 30s, early 30s, and founded the School of American Ballet in New York in 1934. 
He was actually um, started off working in ballet, but was actually between New York and Hollywood quite a bit during those early years. He choreographed for Broadway and uh, for Hollywood, made I think about eight films in Hollywood. And one of them is On Your Toes, which starred his wife, Vera Zorina, a ballerina, his wife at the time. And this um, movie includes a really wonderful ballet sequence called Slaughter on 10th Avenue that is actually still performed today um, as a standalone piece. And so in Hollywood and on Broadway, what Balanchine is able to do is kind of immerse himself in the American character and in American music, in American style and fashion and kind of an American sense of movement. So in 1948, he's pretty much back in New York City to stay and he founds New York City Ballet with Lincoln Kirsten, a philanthropist and arts patron and with co-ballet um, master, co-artistic director, Jerome Robbins. And what's really important about Balanchine is that he, he came from this Russian school, this very classical school of ballet, where we have Sleepy Beauty, The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, all of those big story ballets with swans and princesses and wonderful magical beings, beautiful ballets that we still perform today and love today. But what his vision was, was to take the classical ballet language, those basic formative steps and formal steps of ballet and use them in a new way and turn them into something else and to really push the ballet aesthetic um, into new heights. And so we see with Balanchine um, very high extensions. You can see in this photograph here an extension of what the classical shape really is. He moves away from story ballets into non-narrative and um, uh, ballets that don't have a structure. Um, and really the idea that he had was to strip away the heavy theatricality of, of classical ballet, uh, strip away the sets and the, um, um, the costumes in some ways, and really get kind of drilled down into the movement itself. He created a number of ballets called black and white ballets, where the dancers perform in their black and white um, really practice clothes. And so this is a performance that you see here um, of Aegon, and this is one of his black and white ballets. And again, the idea um, was really to um, highlight the dance itself. He also really emphasized the athleticism of ballet. Ballet is an athletic endeavor, and his, his movement and his sense of what ballet should be was really to um, to highlight its athleticism. And also, um, he developed this style where um, he, he had dancers learn to attack a movement and attack the movement that they were doing with an incredible energy and this breathtaking speed. And that's really what uh, tends to characterize his ballets. And again, he's really invested in this idea of the purity of the dance and really making um, um, dance the visual equivalent of music, the visual equivalent of rhythm, the visual equivalent of cadence and melody. And so what we see happening with Balanchine is that he develops this signature look, a signature style that's um, full of this energy. Um, and this is what really becomes known as Balanchine style and also as the American style of ballet. So since we're talking about makers and muses, um, Balanchine, probably the most important ballet maker of the 20th century, um, also had many muses. Uh, and music was certainly one of them. And Tchaikovsky especially, he felt a spiritual kinship especially with Tchaikovsky, and as well as uh, Igor Stravinsky, as we'll see a little bit later. But dancers were really his most well-known, most famous muses. And he created ballets for specific dancers who, um, uh, who he felt inspired by, um, based on what their bodies looked like, what their bodies could do, based on their personalities. 
and I thought we could just take a quick run through of a couple of them. Um, his first real muse probably was Maria Tallchief, and she was actually um, the first Native American uh, ballet dancer to uh, come of any note. And she was actually also really the first real star of the New York City Ballet. Um, and they actually, she and Balanchine married in 1946. Another of his most famous and important muses is Tanikil Leclerc. You can see this picture is of a ballet called Metamorphosis. It's kind of an interesting picture here, a ballet that um, Balanchine created just for her. They also he divorced uh, Maria Tallchief and married Tanikil Leclerc in 1952. And his last and probably most potent muse was Suzanne Farrell. And she joined New York City Ballet in 1961. Uh, he was mesmerized by her from the start, created many roles for her, including um, Dulcinea in his ballet Don Quixote in 1965, and then also created the diamond section of jewels for her. So Balanchine was loved, uh, loved and was inspired by ballerinas, um, but he was a man of many passions and also loved all kinds of beautiful things, and one of them was jewelry. And he loved the way jewels sparkled. He loved how they were cut. He loved the colors and the brilliance of jewels. And living and working where he did in New York City, he got to walk by this jewelry store every day, a famous Van Cleef and Arpels jewelry store, and got to see amazing jewels in the windows every day as he walked to work. And it's thought that this really was the inspiration for the ballet jewels that he created um, a little bit later in the 1960s. Um, he knew the owners of the store, Claude and Pierre Arpels. They were also incidentally ballet fans. And even in 19, uh, about 1930s and 1940s, they created this series of brooches out of precious gems called ballerina brooches. And we think that Balanchine bought one for his first wife, Vera Zorina, in the in the 1940s. And here I think we see Pierre Arpels on the left, Balanchine on the right, and Suzanne Farrell in the middle in her diamonds costume and kind of, I think, a publicity shot for the ballet. So Jules is a ballet in three acts, as we said, three very different pieces, uh, very different choreographic styles, different music, different tones, different costumes, different colors, and um, representative of three different styles of ballet. And the costumes reflect this representation as well. The first part of the ballet is called Emeralds, and this is a tribute to um, the romantic style of ballet in France in the 1800s. Uh, it has a French composer for this section of the, of the ballet, and the movement is this very fluid and lush and expressive style of movement that was popular in the Romantic era um, in the 1800s. And you can see the Romantic tutu here. A Romantic tutu goes down to about mid-calf, very light and flowy and soft and expressing that movement in such a beautiful way. The middle section is called Rubies and Rubies, um, is by the music for rubies is by Igor Stravinsky, one of Balanchine's musical muses. The music is jazzy and fun and exciting, um, very kind of um, American in flavor and, and kind of got a Broadway style. The movement in the ballet is very formal ballet steps, but done in a very playful and witty and incredibly fresh. Um, and fun way. And you can see the costumes reflect that as well. They're kind of like this uh, sassy little costume. And the athleticism in Ruby as well is on um, a completely other level. Um, and we see Balanchine's concept of neoclassical ballet really shining through in this picture right here to really push um, what we thought of 
as ballet movement and form kind of off its axis. The last section of the ballet is called Diamonds, and this is a wonderful tribute to Russian classical ballet, the ballet of Balanchine's childhood. It's full of symmetry and pageantry. Again, it's not a story ballet like those that the early classical Russian ballets. Really, it's about the joy of dance, the purity of dance. And it's an incredible example as well of um, Balanchine's musicality and his relationship with um, his other musical muse, um, Tchaikovsky, and his love of Tchaikovsky's music and of the art form of ballet. So we can't talk about Jules or Balanchine even without talking about costume designer and costume maker, Barbara Karinska. She was known simply by her last name as Karinska, a collaborator with Balanchine for over 50 years. And um, he had enormous respect for her. You can see his quote here, there is Shakespeare for literature and Karinska for costumes. She was truly an incomparable artist for ballet. Um, and created over 75 of Balanchine's ballets. She was also just a fascinating human being, just incredibly strong, incredibly strong-willed. Um, born in 1886 in the Ukraine to an upper-class family and trained in the art of embroidery at the time, which was common for uh, young women of that social strata. And the skill would eventually really Kind of save her life in a way and also determine her future. She studied law early on and was a newspaper editor for a while, both really unheard of for women at the time, and later had an embroidery shop in Moscow that was eventually taken over by the Soviet government to make flags. And she knew when that happened at this point that it was time to get out of Russia. So she defected and um, took her young daughter with her and an orphaned nephew and she sewed her family jewels into her young daughter's hat um, and her daughter it is said um, complained bitterly about heavy how heavy her hat was but um, she escaped from russia and was able to make it with the family jewels so she ended up in Paris and worked in embroidery again there, um, but eventually was commissioned to make costumes for theater and ballet that was going on in Paris at the time. And here she received her first ballet commission from the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. And who happened to be working there but George Balanchine. And so her very first um, costume assignment was for this ballet by George Balanchine called Cotillon. It was actually designed, the costumes were designed by Charles Berard, a French designer, but um, Karinska was commissioned to actually make the costumes. And she did that quite a bit during this time for both theater and dance, um, using designs by um, fashion designers and also painters and other artists of the day to create costumes. And it was her duty then to choose the fabric and the trim and to make them work on the body of the dancer or the actor. She had um, a wonderful time in Paris and also had a lot of success when she moved over to London and ended up in New York just before World War II. One of her first clients was Gypsy Rose Lee. You can see in this picture here with this amazing and wonderful hat. <laughs> um, Gypsy Rose Lee was a famous burlesque artist and just thought that Karinska's designs imp uh, enhanced her artistry so much and loved her. Um, and she also, during this time, similar to what Balanchine was doing, Karinska was back and forth between New York and Hollywood during this time. And she designed for a few films, including Joan of Arc that you see here in 1948 with Ingrid Bergman and she won the Academy Award for costume design for that year. But Karinska's first love was ballet, and she came back to New York 
and um, in 1949 created her first, designed her first ballet costume. So the ballet costumes she had made in the past were all designed by other designers and George Balanchine really encouraged her to create her own designs. And her first design was for this ballet called Beret Fantasque. And you can see in this beautiful picture of our former, of PBT's former artistic director, Patricia Wilde, who was also one of Balanchine's muses um, and a beautiful prima ballerina for New York City Ballet for many years. You can see that um, Karinska's aesthetic is shining through here, even though you can only see a little bit of the, the top of the bodice of the costume. You can see that the cut of the costume, the elegance, the incredible detail, especially in that headpiece, that her costumes were just um, chic and wonderful and beautiful. In 1963, Karinska became the official costume designer for New York City Ballet, and she spent the rest of her career there. So Karinska is responsible for some really revolutionary changes in the art of costume making and costume design. One thing that she really pioneered was simply the change in bodice panels. You can imagine that on a classical tutu, the bodice is very tightly fitted to the dancer's body. Um, and prior to Karinska, these were like corsets that really didn't allow for enough movement in a ballerina. And Karinska pioneered cutting these um, bodice panels on the bias or on the diagonal. And this is really something that she learned from her time in Paris and her exposure to Paris couture. So this simple change really makes and creates an, elastic, an elasticity that allows room for the dancer's rib cage to expand and move and also allows the dancer to breathe more freely as well. She also used multiple colors of tulle in her tutus and in the tutu skirts. She was very astute, <coughs> excuse me, about the effects of stage lighting. She would go sit in the back of the theater, not only in ballet, but also in, <clears throat> excuse me, in other theaters as well, other plays and things, and look at the costumes and see how the lighting affected them. And she knew and could see that multiple colors of in the, in the tutu skirt created a depth and a fullness that was wonderful and could be felt and really even um, seen by the audience from back in the theater. Another in innovation, <clears throat> excuse me, of Karinska's was the powder puff tutu. And this was a new style of tutu. I think we all are probably familiar with the classical ballet tutu, which is kind of like a pancake or kind of like a frisbee that juts out at the waist of the dancer, kind of encircling the dancer's body in that way. And the powder puff tutu has a really soft and bouncy quality layers and layers of tulle, and in this case, a ribbon as well. This is a tutu from Western Symphony, which was a ballet created by George Balanchine in 1954. And this was her first powder puff tutu. And you can see that it really hugs the body. Um, the bodice comes down a little bit to the hips and the, um, the tutu really starts at the hips, giving a, be a beautiful line to the waist of the dancer and also at the time was considered a little bit daring as well. This tutu um, is also, it has a, a bodice that has 16 panels in it. And when you figure out that the dancer's waistline is about 25 inches, some of the panels are a little over uh, an inch and a half in width. And it is a very form-fitted bodice and it's it's beautiful the the powder puff part of the tutu is only three layers of tulle but what um karinska did was she uh the top layer is gray and it has you can see all the swirls of the different ruffles and all of the ruffles are edged in three-eighths of an inch ribbon that's ruffled onto the ruffle 
Then there's an aqua layer with a two inch ruffle near the edge of it. And the, the bottom ruffle, the bottom skirt is composed of, it's made up of a um, layer of tulle and the ruffles go from the hip down near the edge of the skirt and then back. And that's why it's so fluffy and full. On this, and this costume also has quite a few details, uh, which she was known for. You can see that there's that beautiful headpiece with the feathers and the ribbons and the flowers. And she also has on a neck band and mitts and then the tutu. And then her legs are, um, she has on black fishnets and she has black satin point shoes on. And there's also five large bows on her costumes, uh, two on the shoulders, two at the top of the leg on the underneath the um, third ruffle and one center back. So um, she was very um, much known. She was very known for her details. And when you look at this, you can realize, you can imagine that they're dancing to Hershey K music and one of the songs is Red River Valley. So. She was also known for her color combinations, which were <clears throat> sometimes controversial at the time. And Janet mentioned there's a layer of aqua tulle under this tutu, which you can barely see in this picture here. But she was, received a lot of criticism for that at the time. Balanchine stood up for her and thought she was doing the right thing and the wonderful thing. Just to finish out this section, I just wanted to um, use this quote to show that Balanchine really did feel that some of the success of his ballets, he was incredibly successful, really could be attributed to Karinska. She knew intuitive, intuitively what was needed for a dancer to move. She knew how Balanchine wanted the dancers to move. She knew how to enhance that movement through her costumes and to take his choreography to another level. So, Janet, do you want to go back to, to Serenade? Serenade? Yes, yeah. please. Let's talk That'd a little bit more about this tutu and the use of colors. This, this costume was one of the first that we built after Patricia was um, our artistic director. This is the first ballet that we built under her. And we received, she had them send a, a sample from New York City Ballet. And once I saw it, I was amazed at the cut of the skirt. Uh, the skirt is very full at the bottom, as you can see. And it's because of the way she cut it. She cut it instead of in long straight panels, they were pie shaped panels so that the fullness around the hip was a lot less than the fullness at the bottom of the skirt. And she also did a wonderful cut in the back of it. Um, it's also angled so that when the dancer runs across the stage, the skirt flies out behind her and it's just, just beautiful. Um, I was so fortunate to um, actually see the costume and copy it for the ballet. It really gave me a lot of ideas in cutting that I've used and used many, many times in many different ballets. But um, she was a true genius in, in cut and movement. And you always want whatever the dancer does to look, you know, bigger and better and longer. You know, you want, it, you want the fabric to enhance everything that they do. And she really had a great knowledge for that, for, um, cutting things and using fabrics that would do that. You also see there are two beige panels in the front of her legs and that way you can see her legs more in this costume. You can see them because they are the same color as, you know, uh, closer to a skin tone. The other different mm -hmm. thing about Serenade is in rehearsal, one of the dancers fell and um, George kept it in, in the piece. He thought that that was, um, a good idea. So in Serenade, one dancer does fall, but he choreographed it that way. But it's one of my favorite pieces. And also just for folks who may not be as familiar with ballet, for so when any ballet company does a George Balanchine 
ballet, first of all, they have to get permission from the Balanchine Trust, and then they have to use the costumes that to go with that ballet. So they have to use the Karinska costumes. And Janet, fortunately, has been able to make a lot of our costumes. Ballet companies can sometimes rent costumes from other companies, but Janet has been able to make a lot of ours so that we own our own costumes for these ballets. Okay, so let's get back to rubies and start with emeralds. Emeralds was a lot of fun to build. Um, I used a little bit different colors in the tool of the skirts than Karinska did. We have a little darker shade on the top layer, but um, you can see in the bottom left corner the different colors that we use to make up the skirt. The dark green's the top layer, then there's the beige, and then the aqua is the layer that is the third layer. We also, I wanted to mention when you were talking about the panels on the bodice, another reason that bias panel on the side front works so well, and you can see it very well in this picture, the center front panel is cut on the straight, but the center front panel has more curves in it than any other panel on the bodice. And when you do the side front panels on the bias, they really lay nicely on the body. It's a little wrinkled here, but it's on a mannequin. And um, they never fit the mannequins as well as they do the dancers. But um, in the whole ballet, the emeralds, diamonds, and the emeralds, rubies, and diamonds, they all have petals coming from their bodice. And the male jacket also has petals at the bottom as well. And you can see the tiaras perched on the top of the mannequin on the tool. These are some of my favorite tiaras. We make our tiaras also at the ballet. And what we do is we take millinery wire and we take a metallic gold trim. We pull the stuffing out of the metallic gold tube and then we insert the millinery wire and then we shape it to the shape that we want to make the tiara. And um, oh, yeah. let's get to the tiara picture there. Yes, the yeah. tiara. There's a close up. Now the black wire that you see is is the hat millinery wire that's not covered with the gold metallic. And on stage, you can't see that at all. It just fades into the backdrop. But that's a stabilizing wire for the tiara so that it um, stays in the shape that we originally wanted it to be. And the dancers pin them onto their, their um, Bobby pin them onto their uh, head. And some of them use a great deal of Bobby pins and some just use a few. This is the bodice, uh, the front bodice of the emeralds costumes. And you can see a lot of the jewels are sewn on. And what we would do is we would sew them on one at a time and not each one after we, we stitched it on. Because that way, if one thread broke, uh, you only lost one jewel. You didn't lose a whole bunch of them. So, um, but this, uh, this ballet was very, a lot of fun to make. And I was so happy to do it because um, no one could say I put too many jewels on it because it was called Jewels. Um, this is the male dancer. There's only three male dancers in emeralds. And this is one of the jackets. You will also notice in looking through the slides that the sleeves are all similar in all three of the pieces. They have a little um, gathering around the top of the, near the about five inches from the cap of the sleeve. And so it looks a little fuller at the top and there's a little um, motif with jewels on it. And I think that that makes the dancers have a little broader shoulders. You know, you're always thinking about the body when you're building for dance and the line. There's another emeralds. Tiaras. Now this is rubies. And we built this last season. We built rubies in the 90s also, but um, they were sort of, we used them a lot. So this year when we, we're doing rubies, we decided to do a new set of costumes. And I really enjoy that because um, I, I feel that every day you learn something new and there's always new fibers and new things to use. And if you made a mistake the first time around, you could fix it the second. So I, I was very happy that we got to make Jules uh, rubies again. And um, each of the dancers, the female dancers skirts have about 22 petals. Some of them are satin, some of them are velvet. Each of them are jeweled, and some other girls, depending on, um, some of them have 23 or 24. 
what we did was we put the petals onto a band of the lycra and we snap them to the leotard so that when we wash the leotard we don't have to wash all of the um, skirts also we we feel that that's safer and it's easier plus the petals do weigh a lot and we didn't want them to pull pull the, the costumes and the stretch of the leotards out and near that yellow pin pad there the those little bows that you see are for the sho shoulders of the costumes there's two on each of the dancers but we had to make 12 female costumes in 22 tabs a piece that's a, a lot of tabs now this is where you can see the safety pin and that's where we would put the snap onto the you can see the snaps on the leotards in the center of the picture also and that is how we put this the tab skirt onto the leotard and we we mark that on the dancer individually in a fitting we'll have them come in for a fitting and we will actually pin the the skirt onto the leotard when the dancer has it on it dips slightly in the front then it goes up and on the sides and then it goes dips again in the back a little lower than in the front but it's all in the line of the the body and it's all done to make the dancer look wonderful and this is Kristen pinning the tabs on one of the male jackets all of the tabs in rubies are all backed with a gold lame so that when the dancers dance you can see little peaks of the gold peeking through in the movement of the dance it's fun the men's jackets we made out of a stretch velvet so that they were easy to fit and we made the side seams an area to fit let them in and out and we also made where the satin band at the bottom around the waist we made left a couple inches of velvet underneath that so that we could lower that if we had to if we had a taller dancer that needed to wear the jacket I like the strength in the rubies. I like the strength of the men's costumes, the front, the decor. A lot of the metallic trims are hard to find now. So if we can't find what we want, I will take some metallic thread and embroider it on my embroidery machine. And then we still have the gold that we need behind the jewels. But I really um, was very, we were very happy to build um, rubies. And my team did a great job. It, they really worked very hard and we we got it all done in good time now this is marissa in the costume shop for fitting and you can see that she doesn't have her headpiece on and or her point shoes but um it's sometimes good to see just the costume and then you can focus just on what what it looks like there it is on the mannequin and you can see the the tabs now this is the done rack. That's very exciting for us because we like it when we finish a ballet. And uh, you can even see the men's tights to the left of the photograph. And those are all the men's jackets. Their sleeves are separate from their vests. Uh, they have a easier time to move. When they lift their arms up, their whole jacket doesn't move, just their, just their arms move. And you want, I want everyone to see their arms moving and see how they move I, and I don't want the jackets to move if they're not supposed to but that's what the trick that we do for that this is a rubies tiara principal tiara and you can see again the metallic wire and the the crystals that we sew onto it to um, make her sparkle now this is diamonds and diamonds was made out of one of the first stretch satins that was you know made in the united states and uh, we used it to build diamonds they're very comfortable this year when we were going to um do it in april we made new skirts for the the tutus and we also made new necklaces for the girls because uh, the other ones were sort of um you know they had been used a lot and you can see we use a stretch um, nude fabric to make the necklaces and we put all of the Swarovski crystals on them. Uh, the little round jewels are a hot, uh, hot fixed on. There's a glue on the back of them and you heat them up and then the glue adheres to the fabric and 
we try to put them near the top of the trim, you know, not like sunk into the trim, because then you can get the, the sparkles from all the faucets all around the jewels as well. So there's a close up of it. And they're placed on the dancer in a fitting as well. This is the diamond center front of his jacket. And there are five different trims making up that motif. What we do is we take the trim and we cut it in all different pieces and we make a motif. And then we apply it to the jacket and then we jewel it. These jackets are all hand washable and we hang them up to dry. So this is the tiara from, from diamonds. And the picture to the right is the motif that's on the back of the tiara. It sort of has two loops of gold, the, of the gold trim and the dancer pins it on their, their head, you know, in the back. There you go with the two of them. Now the, the sleeves for diamonds are sewn onto the vest, the jacket part, you know, it's all one piece. And we did that because we cut the sleeves in a way that, that we sort of almost have a straight, just a slight curve on the top of the sleeve so that when the, the male dancer lifts their arm, there's like a built-in gusset to the under part of the sleeve. So works out well. And there's Amanda and Yoshi. Hey, Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We'd love to answer any questions if anyone has any. I just have to say thank you for this. Lisa and Janet, I, I feel like we've been given this window into this amazing world that nobody gets to see. I have seen so many ballets on stage and I don't know, I'm just sort of in awe of, of this and, and I'm kind of a, a groupie of Janet's now. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna- Everybody is. <laughs> and, and this is just, such an interesting look at something we never get to hear about. So thank you both for, for um, joining us and doing this. I know we have some questions coming in. Um, Katie Giggler, the um, Director of Education and Community Engagement for the ballet is on with us as well. She's been helping on the tech end and fielding some questions. So you may hear or see from her as well. Um, we have, have a bunch of things coming in that we'll try to keep up with here. Um, See. Bear with us one second. They come in fast. One question. Uh, the, one of the first ones we got. Um, some Marianne was asking. Let me see. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It was Victoria who said, "What do you do with costumes when you finish the show?" We keep them because we, we always do the ballet again. We'll take them back to the shop and we'll launder them and have them dry cleaned and then we'll repair the repairs that need to be made. And then we, um, we hang them in our storage area. They're all in a dry cleaning bag. You know, they're all covered and they're all hung according to show because when you have 2,500 costumes, if you don't put them in the right place, you can't find them when you need them. Mm -hmm. And then we keep the um, tiaras and things in a clear um, tub, you know, a clear uh, storage container. And we have a label on it of what, what exactly is in there. And the wonderful thing about having our own costumes that Janet and her team make um, is that we're able to rent them out to other companies. So if another company wanted to do jewels or just one of the ballets, rubies or emeralds, we could rent them out. And that's a wonderful source of income for the ballet. Someone asked, do you ever have to iron the costumes? We usually steam them uh, with a steamer. Uh, some of the things we do like to iron, like the silk organzas, because they look better once they're ironed. And there are a lot of silk organza overskirts in a lot of our ballets. Is it easy? Oh, sorry. Uh, stepping in just for Amanda, um, I think there's a little bit of technical issues. Oh, sorry. I, sorry. I muted out for a second. Another 
question was, is it easier to fit a male or female dancer? That's a good question. That's a good question, but I think they're equally as difficult. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all wonderful and um, they're all very nice to work with. Got lots of thank yous coming in. Um, if there are any other questions or anything else that Lisa you want to add or, or Janet, um, just getting a lot of thank yous and thank you for the images and thank you for the close up views of all of these um, beautiful, beautiful things. I just before we wrap up, just wanted to say um, that on both the ballet's website and the Frick's website, um, you know, we are working from home, but we are all working. And there is a lot of online content that you can find at both of our, our websites. Um, there are classes, things we're all offering. There's actually far more online perhaps than we would have been doing in life. I think if you check out our websites and see what we're doing, um, you know, both organizations have upcoming programs and, you know, we're just really grateful to all of you for participating and joining us and for the support, you know, of, of our organizations and really the whole arts community in Pittsburgh. We are fortunate here to have partners like the ballet to join up with and, and present programs like this. I, I hope this isn't the last we get to do with you all because it was really terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. We loved Thank being you. part of it. Thank you so much. It was fun. Uh, let's see, somebody asked if we're going to post this presentation, which yes, we can do. Um, and lots of thank yous. So really, everyone, have a good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.